Well, thank you, Terry, and welcome to Fabian United Methodist Church. If we have not yet had the opportunity to meet, my name is Tim, and it's my privilege to be the 59th pastor of this historic church. A church that was founded in the Methodist tradition in 1837 in the homes of Gladstone's founding families, the homes of the Broadhursts, the Boydstons, and the Fabians. Terry just read to us a passage of scripture from the book of Hebrews, this ancient text written to an ancient people that is being read for and interpreted for us today, some 2,000 years later. So what is the book of Hebrews? Because it's really important that we understand what we're reading so that we can try to understand it within its context, so that we can help it to be useful for us here today. So essentially, the letter to the Hebrews is a written sermon that would have been distributed to the people known as Hebrews in the ancient times. These were Jewish people who had been dispersed all over the known provinces because of um, different captivities that they had experienced. And what the letter is essentially, again, like I said, is a sermon in defense of Jesus as the Messiah. You see, when Jesus came to earth, he said that he was not coming to replace the law, but to fulfill it, the law of Moses, the way in which the Hebrew people live their lives. Jesus said, I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He said, a new covenant I give you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. Essentially, this letter to these people, the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, is a defense of that statement, saying that the Hebrew law has now been fulfilled in the person of Jesus. Essentially, the letter to the Hebrews is helping the Jewish people to develop a new worldview. Now, what is a worldview? I remember the first time I heard that term used. I was in college, and I had a New Testament professor who said that we were going to talk about our worldview, and I was like, I don't get what that means. So essentially, a worldview is the lens with which we understand and interpret the things happening around us, the life that we are living. One of the ways that we as Methodists do that is through something called the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. Madison, if you would throw that slide up for me. The Wesleyan Quadrilateral says that we view God, that's theology, I know we can't read that because it's pretty small graphics, but the thing that's important to me is these lenses, it creates this visual for us. The way that we understand the world and that we understand God, Wesley says, is through our experience, through reason, through tradition, and through scripture. This is essentially what the writer of Hebrews is taking us through in the entirety of the book of Hebrews. These first 10 chapters are giving a scriptural foundation to these Hebrew people. Now, we could read through it, and we could gain some insights on it, like I said last week. And maybe some of you went home and read a little bit of Hebrews and got confused a little bit about some theology. Come ask me about it. I don't have the answer, but I'd love to talk to you about it, see what we can figure out together. But essentially... This is the model that the Hebrew writer is taking us through. He's giving us these pillars, these foundations, so that we can answer this question of how do we know what we know is true? How do we know that Jesus is who he says he is? How do we know that Jesus is the Messiah, the fulfillment of all of these promises? And so the writer of Hebrews takes us through these first 10 chapters and then brings us to this this piece of scripture that is encapsulated in verse 11, a piece of scripture that we started talking about last week. It's this faith of the faith tradition, right? These are the ancestors of the Hebrew people. Now, for us, some of us might know some of these people in these stories, right? When we read about people like King David and, and uh, let's see, who else do we have here? Samuel and Jephthah, Gideon. These are, for me, these are characters from my childhood because I was raised in the home of a Baptist preacher, and when we had story time, it was Bible story time. So for me, this does harken back to my childhood, but for us here today, in the year 2022, maybe it doesn't necessarily ring true to us. But what I hope we learned last week is is that we can look at our own faith tradition, right? I, I start our service almost every week by saying we are a historic church. We can look back at our own faith roots. We can see where we came from, how we formed, how we came to be the people that we are today, a people called Methodist and a people at a church of Fabian. 
So last week we talked about faith being a response to God. God does things in our life, and our job is to respond to them faithfully. So the writer of Hebrews gives us this long accolade and list of people and of all these faith stories that meant something to these people because they understood those faith stories. Again, we could say the same thing. We could talk about the faith of the Broadhursts and the Fabians and the Boydstons. We could talk about the faith of, of, oh, I'm drawing a blank on his last name, but the gentleman who donated for our uh, education wing right behind me. Edgar, what was it? Broadhurst. Edgar Broadhurst, right? We can look back at our own faith tradition and see different times in our own life where maybe we as a church have struggled, but we have come out of those things. One of those stories that I like to tell that's in our memoirs is the story of when the conference told us as a Methodist church to close down. They said, you guys aren't a viable congregation anymore. We've got some other congregations in the Northland. You guys just go ahead and close. And some of you that still embody this very much so were stubborn and said, nope, we're not going to do that. We're going to be a church. This is our church. And we, we survived that tough period in our own history. We came out of it alive again. That's the kind of history that we can claim our faithfulness on as Methodists and as Fabians. But you see this great faith history, this thing that the writer of Hebrews is bringing us to, is bringing us to this climax, this first part of uh, the 12th chapter. The word, therefore, is there. Now, if you've been around preaching for a long time, like I have, the pastor usually says, if the word therefore is there, you always have to ask yourself, what is it there for? So we read the whole previous part, so we don't have to ask what it's there for. It's there because we're talking about our faith tradition. We're talking about people who have lived out faithful lives and things that we can look at, our history, right? He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the people that have come before us, the people whose faith tradition that we stand on. There's a quote from Howard Thurman that has become a favorite of mine. He says, I am what I am at any particular moment by standing on the shoulders of an infinite series of yesterdays. None of us got to where we're at by ourselves. None of us grew up in a bubble. Everything that has happened before has led to where we are, even the people who settled this land. That's why it's important that we go back and we remember that history. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. This was one of my favorite verses growing up because growing up, running was something that I did. It was something that was ingrained into my family history. I have faint memories of my dad going out for runs in North Dakota when we lived there when I was a young kid. When we moved to Minnesota, my oldest brother, Ted, started running track and field. My older sister followed. We then moved to Illinois, and we became a a bit of a dynasty in our local school district. There was four of us that ran for the Winnebago Cross Country Program, and it was something that was ingrained into us. In fact, our license plate said CC Bago. Bago, we were Winnebago, but we we were Bago. And our license plate said CC Bago. When we drove our car throughout town, everybody knew, hey, that's probably a Moline kid because they love to run. So running is something that I have always done. But you see, running gets a little bit of a misnomer. Often we see running as an individual sport because we see an individual competing in that sport. But for me, running was a team sport. I was a part of a program that is still to this day one of the most legendary cross-country programs in Illinois. And I don't tell you that to brag, even though I kind of do because I'm proud to be a part of that program. I tell you that because team is what is driven into us from the very time that we start running for that program. It was never an individual sport. Our girls' cross-country program sent the most consecutive teams to state. Like It's been like 45-some years. They don't miss a state meet as a team. We don't send individuals to state. We don't recognize individuals. I mean, we do because they're there, but we are a team sport. And the reason for that is because running truly, really is a team sport. It may be on me just to run the miles, but I can't do that without my teammates, without the people that I train with. 
I had the privilege of running a marathon a few years back. And I'll never forget the relationships that were bonded in those training sessions of us running these grueling 15, 20 mile runs when it's 90 degrees outside and you're looking at the person next to you and you're like, why am I doing this? And sometimes we didn't know, so we stopped and we took a break. But my point is, is that this, that, that running is a team sport as so is faith. If we look back at the language that is used by the writer of Hebrews in this first part, it's very inclusive, team-oriented language. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. You see, I think oftentimes when we think about our tradition and we look at our tradition, we forget that we are forming and creating tradition right here, right now, today as we move along. And that, that God's word to us may have seems to have ended 2,000 years ago in this book of Revelation and this thing that we have put together, but the reality is, as God says, that his word lives inside of each of us. And so as we look to our life and we say, what is true? How do we know what is true? We look to a great cloud of witnesses. We see the people who have come before us, the faith tradition of those who have practiced their faith and lived out their faith. And the perfect one who gives that to us is this person of Jesus. That Jesus counted it joy to face the persecution that he, persecu that he faced. Now I hear that and I look at that and I, I'm often taken to one of my favorite new words, this place of hyperbole to where I think, well, yeah, you know, Jesus, he was perfect. He loved everybody. Do you know how hard that is? To love the great cloud of witnesses that is around us, the people who are in our lives every single day, and yet the writer of Hebrews says, those are the people that you need to go to. Those are the people that you experience life with, that we are going to run this race together, and it's not going to be easy. Remember the words that came before the therefore? It was people were sawn in two. People were persecuted. Howard Thurman said we stand on an infinite number of yesterdays. None of us get to where we are without the people who have come before us. And so I re as I read through this scripture, I'm brought back to even my own childhood of running and participating and knowing that there is something that can happen amongst us humans that is beyond the physical. It was against the rules for a participant to run next to you in a race like a parent or a coach because they knew that somehow, some way that would help that athlete. We ran together in groups. That's the way our coach taught us to run because he knew we were stronger together. But there was never any ropes connected to us. I never had any of my teammates physically pulling me forward like Millie does for me on a daily basis when we're out walking. There's something that happens to us on this spiritual level when we join together and when we persevere as a team through the trials of our lives. And so I look out at this beautiful church, this place that is full of people who know how to love better than some of any of the people I've met in my life. We know how to love, we know how to bring people in, we know how to say you can be a part of our fellowship. And I think of all of the stories that I have heard from all of you over the years of the things that you have endured. The loss of loved ones, the loss of friends, the disappointment, the different struggles that we each go through. Sure, I'm, they're not being sawn in half they're not being persecuted in ways that maybe the early church was persecuted. But the reality is, is they're still tough. And when we can join together, when we can be a team, when we can lean on each other, when we can remember that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, friends, there's nothing that I don't think that we can do. So whatever that thing is that's in your heart that God is calling you to do, and maybe you're saying, well, how do I know that this is the right things to do? Look at your tradition. Look at the people that surround you. Look at the people who you serve with in this room on a daily and a weekly basis in baby grace and helping out at a turning point in doing things like being here at the church and being available to paint walls 
and to help run electrical and to get new things going. These are all pieces and parts of what we need, and this is our great cloud of witnesses. So as we go forth today, let us go forth in faith, responding to the things that God has called us to. Let's pray. God, I am so thankful that you have made us a relational people, a people that do life and do ministry together. So God, help us to remember the great cloud of witnesses that has come before us, as well as the great cloud of witnesses that are here with us today. Let us be for this community, your church and your people. In all the holy names of God, we pray these things. Amen.